This week on the Marketplace of Ideas, we'll talk to David Lipsky, contributing editor at Rolling Stone, winner of the 2009 National Magazine Award, and author of Although, of course, you end up becoming yourself. A road trip with David Foster Wallace. It's the Marketplace of Ideas. I'm Colin Marshall. David Lipsky is a contributing editor at Rolling Stone and the author of The Art Fair, $3,000, and Absolutely American. His latest book is Although, of course, you end up becoming yourself, a road trip with David Foster Wallace, which comes actually from a magazine piece he wrote, the winner of the 2009 National Magazine Award on David Foster Wallace. David, welcome to the program. It's great to be here, Colin. Thank you. I want to tell you first one thing that I imagine about the creation of this book. Tell me if it's right or wrong, but as the listener probably knows by now, this book is made out of transcripts of tapes you recorded while you were on the road with David Foster Wallace for five days during his publicity tour for his big novel in 96, Infinite Jest, the one that yeah, broke him. Yeah, it sounds like it. The one that broke him to a much wider audience, it sounds like. And you didn't end up writing the article that these notes were for, a Rolling Stone profile at the time. That got that got canceled. So you had these lying around, I presume, or stored somewhere. And I, w- I would imagine after after David Foster Wallace's untimely death in 2008, you know, when you heard the news of that, I imagine you just your mind went immediately to these materials you had, all this conversation you had with David Foster Wallace uh, that. And I imagine there's a huge crushing sense of responsibility as to you're thinking, I've got to do something with these. But, you know, what? Is, is that accurate at all? Well, no. The, what, when it, it, it's interesting, but, but when I first heard that he had died, I, I think like a lot of people, I didn't think it was true. Uh. So I got an email from a friend, and I assumed it was a prank just because if, if you, you know, if spending time with David, what, what you have a sense of is just how mentally healthy he was. I mean, there was. If you had asked me in the summer of 2008 to name the the, the most healthy mentally uh, American writer, I would have, without any hesitation, said David Wallace because he just had seemed like he'd gone through something when he was younger, but he seemed healed. He just seemed he seemed like someone who who had kind of a wise, funny, sharp way of looking at life, which actually would 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 tend to make you live longer, uh, not less long. So no, I was shocked. So my first response was just tremendous surprise. You saw this health in him in terms of, is that just from your experience with him in 96, traveling for a few days, getting the first person encounter, or was that from his work as well? You, you saw all this you described. It was from both. I mean, I only knew him for those five days. Um, mm-hmm. And in the five days, what, what you read us talking about is just how he'd gone through a very hard time when he was in his late 20s and had found a way to, to experience the world after that. And that was what I'd been reading in his work. And what I then read in his work afterwards. I mean, it was uh, the the person who writes a story like Good Old Neon, the person who writes uh, nonfiction like a uh, supposedly fun thing or considered a lobster, is somebody who it's not somebody who hasn't had hardships or wouldn't know how to go through. It's somebody who has, in the full way of a life, kind of kind of tested themselves against hardship and come out with with a kind of warm comic knowledge. And that was one of the things that that you love about his work. That's one of the things I think readers always feel is that. He has seen all the crap stuff, all the hard stuff they've they've seen, but he's also still incredibly aware, incredibly alive, and incredibly funny. The story you mentioned, Good Old Neon, it's gotten a lot of rereading in the wake of of Wallace's death, simply because of the character it describes. There's this character that goes toward an end by his own hand in the story, and it even it even holds up a character called David Wallace who has avoided that, and. It does seem, you know, you mention all this and you think of other stories like there's a story he wrote called The Depressed Person, and an illustration of this this phenomenon of depression that he it's now revealed that he suffered from himself. And there seems to be so much there that indicates that uh, David Wallace understands all of these problems and has somehow transcended them. Is that I think of that as a big paradox of his life and how and how he wound up. I mean, is is that the same way you think about it, that there's. There's all this understanding, but yet he ultimately did succumb to the same thing. It seems like he yeah, I, had a I did. And when I read when I read Good Old Neon in 
in the it, it came out in in book form in 2005. Uh, I'm not a crying reader, um, but that's one of the only short stories I read and cried at the end of because of this beautiful line when he says, um, when, he, when the narrator becomes David, and he says, David Wallace, uh, emerging from years of literally indescribable war with himself, when with considerable more intellectual firepower than he had in high school in 1982. Um, I felt that, and I knew, that's one of those nice things of having spent time with someone, I knew what he was talking about. And I felt this great sense of power and health in that line. It was, it, and and then it's just as a reader, I felt that that thing of what a life is, which is that you do. Someone who's awake and aware, the kinds of people who like to read, the kinds of people who turn to books to find a little bit more about their lives, um, they've all gone through that kind of um, internal internecine conflict. And to see him saying that, uh, I hadn't spoken to him then for for uh, almost ten years. I felt very warm for him. These transcripts of your five-day conversation with David Wallace that you've made this book out of, after the profile in Rolling Stone you were going to write was canceled, did you ever have a suspicion you you would do anything with these? I did, and every couple of years I would read them again. You know, there were things, when you love a writer, you want to get, you want their opinions of the world. There's, um, uh, I'm going to apologize to your listenership for quoting from uh, uh, early 20th century French writers. But uh, there's a great quote from Proust where uh, the narrator says that when you love a writer, when you really love a writer, what you want is an opinion from them on everything in the world. And one of the great things about, about spending that time with David was that I'd gotten that. And so I would think about things he had said. He had said some great things about how to write. And so I would think about that. And then he had said a lot of kind of dark, you know, uh, dark, uh, dark night doubt stuff, which is very helpful to very helpful to me as a reader and then as someone who also writes um there, he, you know, there's that lovely thing where he says uh he says what you should do as a writer he said that the writer you know he says that writers aren't smarter than other people but what they might be is more compelling in their confusion <laughs> and then he says that what a writer really does is wake the reader up you know to stuff the reader has seen all along and then there was this lovely thing where he said i mean when you were with him you could see just how charming and incredibly smart he was but what he said the way he saw himself was he said look I'm, I'm not the smartest writer going, but I work really, really hard. You know, I may, I, may be, I may not be that smart in a room in person, but if you give me 24 hours alone, then I can be really, really smart. And so I would often think about, you know, if I, was, if I had a deadline with 24 hours to go, I would think, okay, your favorite writer says, you know, 24 hours you can be really, really smart, and you're not him, but maybe you can rise to the occasion the way he would. Um, so I, I would read, I would think about those things, and... I would read. I would read that time together, and then after David died, some some people called and asked me to, who knew I spent that time with them. Uh, some people called and asked me to to talk about him, and I did. I didn't really want to at first, and then I had this terrible fear that that people would begin to see David not as this incredibly funny, brilliant, bright writer who would change the way prose works. I mean, every every good writer who now writes part of what they're doing takes into account the way David really improved and, uh, you know, streamlined prose, right? Um, and I was afraid people would forget that David, and they would just begin talking about the David who had died, and they'd begin looking through his, through his work to see hints. They'd be on kind of a clue search, and I didn't want the David who did the work, the, 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 the David who was incredibly fun to be with, to be lost. And then as I began to report the story you were talking about earlier, the Rolling Stone story, when it became clear that what he had died from was not anything personal, but but kind of a, a medical situation, it became more and more clear that, that 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 a way that I could kind of help people keep in mind what David was really like, what he actually had been like as a writer, was by saying, "Look, here's what he was. Here's here's how it feels to spend time with him. Here's what he was like on an hour by hour basis." And since you had these these transcripts yourself, and you would reread them periodically, and they were so much your own thing to go back to, your own piece of Wallace to sort of re-examine periodically. Was there a feeling then that you were taking something that was very much your own, very much your own private thing, and bringing it into the world? And how much did you think about what you would, what kind of a challenge it would be to, to convert this from sort of a, a thing just for you to something you could make for David Foster Wallace's fans? 
Yeah, I'm smiling because there's a great moment uh, early in the book. Do you remember what David and I are at that pizza place? It's about, I, I think it must be about page 10 or 15. It's one of the first things he says. And he says that, uh, that um, you're going to uh, be managing the impression of me. And that <laughs> yes. to me is extremely disturbing because <laughs> I want to shape and manage the impression of me that's coming across. And so when I was looking, when I was reading through the time we had together, I just thought, look, here's the best thing is not to say my assumptions about him and not to say here's how he probably felt when he was growing up, but just to have him tell his own story. You know, in the, um, in the second part, you know, the, in the book, we, uh, we're on his book tour, and we fly off to the last event he's doing for Infinite Jest, and he's incredibly relieved to have the tour over because he has very mixed feelings about publicity. But then on the way back, for some reason, he seems to have decided just to, to tell me how he grew up, to, to tell me how it felt to write his books, to tell me how he decided to become a writer. And that, to me, seemed incredibly valuable, just him telling his story as himself. You know, and that was, um, that was something, as I was reading the transcripts again, that seemed like an incredible thing to give readers. What was your relationship like with his work before... Before this whole road trip, were you had you read all of his books up to that point? I forget. Yeah, you can't avoid it. I mean, he, um, you know, his first book came out right after. I think it came out my last year in college, and you're always kind of looking and saying, "Hey, who else is publishing?" And it was this giant book that was incredibly smart. Um, he, <laughs> yeah, I'm laughing because he, he had very big feelings about that book. He says to me, um, "You know, the Brew of the System. That's his first novel. Had a, had a lot of fans, but unfortunately, they're all about 11." <laughs> um, <laughs> But, I, you know, I, uh, I had read that, and then his book of stories came out about two years later, which, again, he was much harder on, uh, I think, than, than we were. When that book came out, uh, I was in New York uh, trying to um, find ways to write and also um, uh, not feeling incredibly turned, uh, tense and nervous on supermarket lines. Um, <laughs> but his, uh, that book came out, and everyone passed it around. It was one of those books where other writers and other really smart readers would say, look, you have to read this. And I'd say, oh, man, it's, it's another Wallace book. This is great. And there were stories in there um, that were just incredibly sharp. There, there's a critic that David really loves and who we talk about in the book named Pauline Kale. She was the New Yorker's critic for a long time, really a brilliant writer. And Wallace was kind of making this march on making himself, you know, this march towards the capital city of readers. Um, about four years after that book came out, Pauline Kale was giving her last interview. She'd retired from The New Yorker, and she just mentioned kind of out of the blue that her favorite two short stories by a young writer in the last couple of years had been these two stories from that book, um, the story about Lyndon Johnson called Lyndon and uh, the story about, uh, uh, the story about uh, a young actress going on the David Letterman show called My Appearance. So you were, you know, you were feeling him as a, as a reader. And at Rolling Stone, there's a thing we do every year called The Hot List where we say, here's what's coming that you have to pay attention to. And so it became a bit of a joke in the, in the meetings we had every year for the hot list. Um, me and some other people kept saying, David Foster Wallace. And so, you know, after a couple of years, those meetings would begin with people saying, look, don't say David Foster Wallace. <laughs> so there was this great thing in, in 95, in late 95, when his cruise ship piece came out, and literally everybody in the city who read seemed to be talking about it, where we could turn to people in the magazine and say, hey, look, he's great. <laughs> And we know that before the cruise ship piece, before Infinite Jest, he had a definite he had a definite following. Of course, he had a campus following, and he had he had readers that were like yourself, uh, writers that were around his age that were also reading what other people of their generation were being published. And you had kind of the Pauline Kales of the world as well. But this moment that you are with. Wallace in this book in '96, Infinite Jest. He's just becoming huge. On uh, he's just looming on the cultural scene of the time. But you mentioned the cruise ship piece coming out, and that being what got the sort of hot list attention. How much? How much of what was breaking him through to the wider world was Infinite Jest? How much of it was p- those pieces, like like uh, shipping out? It was called then a supposedly fun thing. I'll never do again. It's called it's called now. What was actually breaking him through? Uh, well, what a great sentence that is, too, right? I mean, if you're, if you're looking at how to just to construct, if you want to see kind of what's great about David's writing, just, just that title is so great, <laughs> the way that sentence works, a supposedly fun thing I'll never do again. Yes. So great. Um, it was very funny. I talked to one of the people at the time who were, uh, who were helping David to become known, one of the people who was helping kind of market him, and I asked the same question that you asked. 
and they said, yeah, that had kind of been on purpose, and those things don't normally work, but it's nice when they do. You know, what, uh, kind of what, what, what they had sort of described was that um, the cruise ship piece would kind of cut the landing strip, you know, and then, uh, w- w- which then the great, the great jumbo jet of uh, Venice could, could, could kind of uh, descend to and land on. Um, it was a great thing. I mean, everyone knew, everyone before, before there's, before that kind of double, that double punch of those books came, everyone kind of knew. Um, he'd published a very long piece of journalism in Harper's Magazine, which is also where Shipping Out uh, premiered, about his visit to the State Fair. It was called A Ticket to the Fair. And when I read that in the summer of 94, as someone who'd been following him, I could see that he'd taken an incredible, uh, incredible jump. And uh, when, when, when he turned in Shipping Out, the cruise ship piece to Harper's, there's a great thing that his editor, Colin Harrison, there said, he said, uh, we, 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 as readers, we knew we had pure cocaine on our hands. I mean, <laughs> I it was, love that. It, yeah, isn't it great? It was that good. And so it was an amazing thing when that piece came out because, you know, the people, the, the readers and, and, and writers uh, who were around David's age were just then coming into, like, their late 20s to, to early to mid-30s. And there's that sense of, like, who's going to sound like us? You know, well, well, what are we as a group? You know, how do our brains work? How do, you know, there's a great phrase of David's brain voice. What's our brain voice? And particularly when that piece came out, when, when Shipping Out came out, there was this great thing. It's a little bit, uh, there's, a, there's a very funny story that I think, um, I think it's Joan Didion uh, writes about in the 60s, uh, being, at a, being at a party in Grange Village, which for readers who are not New York-centric, listeners who aren't New York-centric now is like, uh, the, that's like the, uh, the, the RD, uh, the, the, the sort of artistic solar center of the city, right? And she talks about hearing a Sarah Lawrence type. And if you're a Sarah Lawrence type, that's like, uh, that's like the exact middle of the, uh, uh, of the sun in terms of New York artiness. <laughs> but, but, but hearing a Sarah Lawrence student uh, drop down cross-legged at a, you know, uh, to the floor at a party and announce the only person in the world who could understand her was J.D. Salinger. <laughs> and that's kind of how it felt watching people read uh, Shipping Out and then reading Infinite Jazz. There was just this sense of, God, this is actually how, it's a flattering way to think about yourself, this is how my brain sounds privately. And here this writer has come, you know, for people who hadn't been following him, this writer has come out of nowhere, and he's sounding the way we all think we sound. And it was just incredibly, incredibly thrilling. It's just one of those moments you know. Uh, He was such a great writer that people at Harper's, who I knew at the time, they would brag about talking to him. When he came through the city, they would say, yeah, I talked to Wallace in the hallway, or David Foster Wallace was here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's a, <laughs> I'm laughing because there's a moment, um, and it's, it's early in the book, but there's a moment before I went to, to meet David. Uh, my girlfriend was visiting me in February of that year, and uh, you know, I went out to the kitchen, and I came back into, into my bedroom, and on my computer was an email from a person at Harper's who she'd written to describing what David was like. You know, he's a big hulking guy with stringy hair, looks like a rock star, wears a bandana, is unmarried, I believe. What were your other questions? <laughs> yes, I remember that. <laughs> so that's what it was like. Um, and the great thing about his work was people who didn't, you know, the kind of, the, the, there are people who I think all of us look to as very serious readers, um, and often, like they'll they'll recommend things to me that are too serious, or they'll they'll want me to read, or they'll want you to read kind of a, a very difficult long book. And those people, of course, had been talking about David for a long time, um, and they were talking about the cruise ship piece, and they were talking about Infinite Jest. But the great thing about both those books and and about the the cruise ship piece when it came out was people who didn't normally read for fun, or people who read for a different kind of late fun, they were they were talking about that piece everywhere. They were faxing it to each other. They were reading it out loud to you on the phone. So it was an incredibly exciting time. And then it was just really weird. It's one of those weird things you get as a reporter when Jan Wenner, the guy who owns our magazine, said, okay, Dave, go, you know, go spend a week with him. <laughs> Indeed. That's, I, want to, I want to touch back on that line you mentioned from the Atlantic editors or the Harper's editors. I forget which, I think the Atlantic saying... Um, saying no, that, 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 that's the, the cocaine line, that's, yes, exactly. um, that's Colin Harrison at Harper's, who's a really brilliant editor. Harper's, yes, and saying with the pure cocaine on our hands. And I hear similar sentiments about the, the addictiveness of Wallace's writing. And it's often said about, of course, the cruise ship essay, the fair essay, the more recent ones about the, uh, the radio host. And you know, all, all of these essays he's written, I hear people talk about how addictive they are, how like cocaine they are. And I can't help but notice I hear that said a lot less about his fiction. And if I think about it, I maybe don't hear it at all said about his fiction. I hear a lot of admiration for his fiction. I hear, oh, you've got to read Infinite Jest. I never hear 
Infinite Jest was so addictive that I couldn't put it down. And it strikes me that that's that's so tied with his image in the time period of your book because this is the publicity tour for Infinite Jest. You know, you say David Foster Wallace, they say Infinite Jest. Here is this huge thing that he's tied with that's so that's so in the zeitgeist. And I, David Shields was on this program recently, author of Reality Hunger. We were talking about your book, and we were we were saying uh, he was saying to me, he's like Colin. You'll notice you read David Lipsky's book. And they talk a lot about the essays. They talk about the cruise ship essay. They talk about the fair essay. They're not talking that much about infinite jest. He thinks that means something. Do you think that means something? Yeah, you know, I, I thought David's book was great, um, and he is an extremely smart man. But I'm going to question. I'm going to question his word count. Actually, <laughs> we spend much more. I think when we only talk about his nonfiction um, a little bit. And the, I mean, he says a great thing about nonfiction. He says that the nonfiction is welcome to my mind for 20 pages. Here's all the French curls and crazy circles. <laughs> and he said that that stuff's really interesting narratively because, you know, it's a way of making our thoughts interesting. And most of our thoughts aren't that interesting. They're mostly just confused. And so really that kind of writing is, is how to be sincere with the motive. I thought was kind of brilliant. <laughs> But no, we I mean we only talk about his nonfiction a uh, little, and he, which I think is kind of great. He he's very irritated about he's about to put out a supposedly fun thing. He's been working on editing those essays into book form, and he says he's just really irritated. He's done too much uh, nonfiction for the last year, and he's been jacklighted by these projects. So it's to me, this sort of a nice irony that what a lot of readers who just find their way to Wallace, what they first love, are these pieces. At the time, he was kind of irritated about having to put together. <laughs> no, I, I was thrilled to be talking to him about how he put this gigantic book together. I mean, he was really funny about it. He um, he talked about being very nervous about the length and sending the the well, one of the first uh, written on a computer drafts of Infinite Jest to his editor in New York, and <laughs> trying to do a very clever thing of printing it in nine point type. <laughs> right, I remember that. Oh, yeah, yeah, so great. Um, and then being very nervous the three days it took to print, seeing just how long the thing was going to be. I did enjoy certainly the the sections. I mean, and I'm I'm not saying that I don't think there was any talk about Infinite Jest because, of course, I mean, there's so much I love from him talking about writing Infinite Jest, like the the final stretch where he puts on the headphones with nothing coming through them and, oh, so and great, it yeah. walls himself in and he doesn't have any money, just only has him and the keyboard and nothing. nothing I love in the that room. too. And yeah, I I enjoyed all that, but I I think that I think that it. It isn't. I, it's significant that David Shields remembers only uh, only talk about subjects that he associates with Wallace's nonfiction, because I don't know this to be a fact about Wallace, but I I do imagine. Tell me how off or on base you think it is that there's so most of the public appreciation I hear for his work goes toward the nonfiction, and it sounds like he was less into the nonfiction than he ever was into the fiction, by far. Do you think that was the case? I remember reading uh, a quote in a, in a piece that Dan Max wrote about David uh, in The New Yorker, this, this really strong, long piece that came out in the spring of 2009, where David was writing to, uh, to his fellow writer Don DeLillo, who's a great novelist who David really, really admired. And he's saying he doesn't really understand why it's so much easier in a certain way to write nonfiction than, than fiction. But, you know, I think uh, the way I think about it, because, you know, I, I think uh, f- for me, uh, the essays are really fun, and I think that just for sheer fun value, there's nothing that's more fun. The, the, the hundred pages, you know, in, um, in Harper's, the piece was cut by, by about half. And for listeners who want to start on David Wallace, uh, harpers.org has an in-memoriam page. They, they did this great thing after David died, which was, again, trying to remind readers of what Wallace as a writer was like. Um, they have a page where you can download for free um, everything that he published in the magazine. It's all great stuff. And so if you go to that page, it's, uh, if you just search online, harpers.org, uh, <laughs> harpers.org, I guess that's the BC version of, of harpers, uh, harpers.org, uh, David Foster Wallace Memoriam. Um, you can just download shipping out if you haven't read it, and it really is just about the most fun, uh, you know, 40, 50 pages of prose that's been published in the last 15 years. It's just incredibly fun. I mean, and I think one reason that people love his nonfiction is that when you read it, and when people talk about it, it is, the cocaine thing is nice. It makes you, reading it changes after you put the stuff down. It changes the way you're thinking about the world. It makes you smarter, which is one of the great things that, that, that books do, just looking at it. You know, one of the nice things about David as a person, what made him different than other writers, is he has a sports background. I mean, you know, he, he, he grew up, he talks about this in the book, he grew up wanting to play football. 
then the kids were hitting a lot harder, and he wasn't as big as the kids when he was about 12, so he found tennis and then became a really serious junior tennis player and then began writing when he was 21. So he, you know, he went into the writing world with all the experiences of someone who'd grown up in the Midwest, always around sports, which I think is one reason why his range, even though people talk about him sometimes, I think incorrectly, as being like a tough writer to read, that the, 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 the sentences might be long and stuff. In fact, what makes him so charming and fun and different for readers than, than more, more eyeglass-wearing writers, uh, I speak <laughs> as someone wearing eyeglasses myself right now, so I'm betraying my tribe. Um, one, one of the things that makes him really fun is that his background isn't only literary. Um, and so to speak about, uh, you know, to look at books not just as, as sentences, sort of, but to look at them just for kind of use value, one of the great things, if, you have to, if, you, if you're in a situation where you want to feel a lot smarter all at once, just pick up, you just pick up one of those essays, and you feel suddenly much more alive. Just what he said, fiction does, where it wakes the reader up to things they've noticed all the time. You'll feel much more mentally alive and awake. The fiction does that, and it does, it does other things, too. I mean, one way I came to think about this, and maybe it's wrong, is that the, the journalism seemed like a public act. You know, it seemed like something that was the, 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 the way you would talk about yourself if you were at a party, the way you would speak socially. And the fiction is more private, and so it gives you... It, it, it's sort of like when you get to know somebody as a friend, right? There, there's this great glossy social self that you'll meet in your office, or you'll, meet, you'll, you'll meet in the classroom, or you'll meet you know, kind of walking around with your other friends, and that person seems incredibly sharp and funny, and it's great to be around. And then as the friendship kind of deepens, you'll see what their life is actually like, and that, to me, seems to be the difference between David's nonfiction and his fiction. Now, if you step back, or if I step back, and think about the sort of things that Wallace published. I think about him being known for a very large novel with a lot of footnotes, with so much information, so much detail, and being known for a number of essays as well, and being known for these deep critiques of society that he had and the way we relate to information and entertainment and one another. I think of comparable writers, you know, who did these sorts of things before him. And, you know, I'll think of a writer, writers like William Gaddis, for example, and I will. Th- I don't think of them as particularly accessible. Yet uh, Wallace is. I mean, I can't make the argument that he's inaccessible. What do you think the difference is? I, I think it's part of David not coming from. Uh, not coming from. I mean, he, what he said is reading was always this weird thing he did on the side, and the way he began writing was that his college roommate, another great writer named Mark Costello, just wrote a senior thesis that was a novel, and David said he hadn't known you could do that. He, he, um, <laughs> he also said. Uh, I also, <laughs> I grew up a big comic book reader. I mean, let, me, let, let me apologize for readers who don't know what's great about comic books. And so he's kind of talking about what in a comic would be his origin story. And he said that the one way he realized how good a writer he could be was that on his dorm, you know, when he was, let's say, a junior in college, he began writing papers for other people as a favor, you know, if they were in a bind. And so what he would do is he would, he would look at other papers they'd written as a way to kind of, I'm just quoting him now, as, as, as a way to kind of get their verbal music. It's a great phrase. And he realized, he said, oh, look, I realized I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a weird kind of forger. I can kind of sound like anybody. Um, he'd, also, he'd also come at that by uh, he and Mark had started a humor magazine, or they had resuscitated a humor magazine at Amherst College. Um, and so when he, when he moved into writing this, when he moved into writing his novel after he saw that Mark could do one as a senior, as a senior thesis, um, I think that what was in his mind was just being fun. You know, I'm not sure that's always in, I'm not sure that's always in writers who are thought of as difficult. It doesn't feel to me that that's paramount in their mind, but it seems to have been something that, that David was aware of and that his readers reward by loving his work in a way they don't really always love other writers. Now, in terms of being fun, I suppose we should clarify that a bit. In terms of being fun in a sense that he is making something that he knows other people will find fun? Well, what he said was that, um, that w- w- when something works, he talks about it in the book, when something works for him, it becomes a lie for him. And, uh, you know, I think that he, uh, I, my sense is that for him, Part of what makes something alive is that it has these brilliantly fast connections, and it sorts. And the, the verb he would use is the Cox knowledge. I mean, he said the part of part of the experience that he wanted to get across to readers. And I think again, why he's made this incredible connection with readers is that when he read other kinds of fiction, and we were we were arguing in a way about writers like John Updike, uh, who made life seem more clear than it felt to David. He would say, uh, I, "I read those kinds of things." 
uh, we're also talking about uh, Tolstoy a little bit. I read those things not, you know, they don't seem true. I read them as a relief from what's true. And he said that for him, what, what life was, what a day was like, was, was about a half million pieces of discrete information coming at him all at once, and he had to sort through it and find the 25 that are actually important. And that, and that's, of course, one of the things that makes the cruise ship piece so fun. And what makes Infinite Jest so fun also is the experience that we now have as people, which is going through a world where there is so much information thrown at, it all, thrown at us all at once, and a trying to keep our funny, independent, smart selfhood uh, separate from that, and also trying to figure out what from that, what he called that tsunami of information, uh, what from that we have to absorb into ourselves. How much of this way that Wallace described life in terms of pulling out the 25 pieces of information you need from the tsunami. How much of that was modern life in, with all the sort of cliches that brings along with it? How much of it was... Cliches? Simply, Sorry. Well, I mean, <laughs> Go ahead. Go well, ahead. The, well, first of all, wouldn't, wouldn't you agree that bringing up modern life, and I'm, the way I'm saying it, saying modern life is complicated, I'm saying a cliche. So oh, that's no, no, a, no, but he has this, I mean, he had this great thing, which I think about literally every day a couple of times now. He just said that what modern life is about now is being on one end or the other of electronic data transfer, which oh, is yes. so brilliant. Yeah, so, I mean, that's... That, that's how it feels when I'm, when I'm working. That's how it feels when I'm answering email or sending email or going on Twitter or going on Facebook. I just think, God, he nailed it, and he nailed it in 1996. <laughs> but anyway, but you were saying the, the, yeah, the, the, the stuff about incorporating modern life. Yes, well, I'm, I'm saying he, he put that in a better, more accurate way. You can say modern life is tough, oh, these modern problems, technology, and that sounds – and it's easy to make that sound cliched. He put that in a, in a clearer way, but – how much of that was the life itself and how life has become for everybody? And how much of that was simply the condition of Wallace's mind? And that even in, even in the early 20th century or the 19th century, he would have had this same deal where every, where he noticed so much that he would have felt information bombarded kind of no matter what. You know, we, um, I, I'm smiling because, uh, that's one of the things that we argue about. And um, it's one of the things, you know, later in the book when we've been talking for five days and we're both really tired, <laughs> he says, look, it was probably always that way. It's heightened. It's heightened for us because there's just, you know, we have better distribution systems for information. You know, there's part of it wants to say, yes, it was always like that. I mean, uh, you know, there was, you know, we have that sense that we're the only people who can't make an easy distinction between what we've seen in movies and TV and, and, and what's happening in front of us on the page. But I remember I loved, I was reading some old Hemingway journalism, which I hope makes up for the Proust thing earlier. Um, <laughs> and uh, Pr uh, Proust, Hemingway was, on, a, was, on, the, was one, on one of the beaches at Normandy, and he was talking to a colonel. And the colonel said, uh, Ernie, you know, there were times when I didn't know if it was real or if I or, 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 or I'd walked into, um, I'd, go, I'd stepped into a B-movie and was wondering, hey, this is where we came in. So I think, A, there's part of you that says, that wants to say this is what it's always been like to be a person. But I do think that's very heightened. And I don't think it was necessarily just David. That's one of the funny things, one of the weird things about only getting to have one go through of being alive is that you tend to think that everything that you feel is a reflection of, you know, how you grew up, mistakes your parents made, um, you know, <laughs> or good things your parents did, or where you went to school. And so you think those, are, those things are why you see the world. And... It often turns out, and you'd find out if you got to live a second or third time, oh, that's just what it is to be alive. And that's part of what's great about David's work and why it connects with people, is that him, the way he experienced the, the way he experiences life now, modern life, what you were talking about, is kind of the way it feels to everyone. And it's one, it's one of the things that he wanted writing to do. He said that, that writing is the only way, because we were talking about what, you know, at a time then, it was, this is before the web was... The, um, the great attention competitor that's become now for, for writing. He was saying, how do you, you know, how do you keep writing alive and attractive to people at a time when movies and then TV were making such noisy appeals, you know, gra uh, grabbing people on the shoulder and saying, watch this, see this. And he said that writing was the only way that you could actually kind of jump over that wall of self and make people um, feel a little bit less lonely because you realize, ah, another consciousness like mine exists in the world. If you've just tuned in, this is the Marketplace of Ideas. I'm Colin Marshall. My guest is David Lipsky, contributing editor at Rolling Stone and author of Although, of course, you end up becoming yourself, a road trip with David Foster Wallace. You can hear this show again or any other in the Marketplace of Ideas archive at colinmarshallradio.com, our official website. 
Any comments, questions, feedback, whatever you want to send along, send that to Colin, C-O-L-I-N, at ColinMarshallRadio.com. That's Colin at ColinMarshallRadio.com. Now back to the conversation with David Lipsky. So how much do you think of, of Wallace's appeal was that he thought about, he perceived, he noticed things in the world differently, or was he just better, I mean, exquisite at at writing all this down, at getting, at thinking the same way about things as other people, but transferring them into words in much better than anybody else could? Now, that's a great question. You know, I think there's two things that a writer has to do. First is... Um, God, more quotes. Uh, David keeps making fun of me in the book for, for using lit, uh, lit, lit quotes. Oh, so, yes. uh, so another apology. Um, there's a great thing. Uh, Henry James was talking to people who wanted to be writers in the, uh, I guess, 1890s, 1880s. And, uh, and he says, look, you have to become one of those people on whom nothing is lost. And there's this great quote that, uh, about Gertrude Stein meeting Hemingway. And she says, um, I, I just met the most interested young man. What, what a writer has to develop is, first, he has to develop, he or she has to develop, uh, so a tiny bit of sexism, too. She has to develop. <laughs> There's a great thing that, that, that David did for a lot of his essays uh, in the, throughout the 90s. He would always describe the reader as she, which I thought was great. Um, you know, she, she, what she has to develop first is an ability to notice those things, to, um, to, kind, of, um, to kind of be awake and to, and to kind of register everything that's going on around you, which can be painful, obviously, right? Um, and then the second thing you have to develop, once you develop that, is you have to develop a way to express it that people can follow, that's fun for people, and that they can read and say, yeah, that's how it feels inside me, too. So you have to both develop the, um, the reception factory and then develop a highway to get the information out to other people. And he seemed, you know, writers can often have one or the other, um, but he seemed to, to, as you said, to, to have exquisite talent at both. There is a pretty incisive point that he, he touches on, I believe, a few times in, in the book, in the course of your conversation with him. He, it's, it's, it's a theme he's brought up elsewhere as well, but the idea that he talks to, he's talked to Jonathan Franzen about it, about the idea of the kind of the, the reader, the reader writer contract and how how much is it communication to the reader that you're doing and how much of it is avoiding trying to make yourself look smart you know he has a lot of points about how he had to transition away from making himself from his message being look how smart i am and i want to get your own opinion as a writer on this all as well i mean there's so much that gets that, that wallace always said about about this relationship one has to the reader is did this loom as large, these issues, for you as they did for him? How a writer relates to the reader, what sort of messages are being sent to a reader, avoiding simply trying to impress the reader, this whole suite of things Wallace seems to have thought so much about as a writer. I mean, did, did these questions affect you in the same way as well, since you're also obviously a writer? Yeah, for, for, for me as a writer, what I... I mean, life is confusing, right? And that's something that, that, uh, that David and I are talking about. But life is simply confusing. And you, um, I mean, the thing, that we, the thing that we're debating in the book, in the part of the book uh, after which he looks at me and says, I'm not sure you're a very nice man or not, <laughs> because I'm, I'm disagreeing about how difficult it is to, to, move the, move, to, to move through the world with a sense of a narrative unfolding for you. I mean, uh, 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 to me, life is grindingly chronological and it's grindingly narrative. There tends to be there, there tend at any moment to be one or two things you really want, a piece you want to get finished, a book you want to do, a person you want to meet, and then there's a lot of other stuff. There's a lot of like the the, the middle of a book, right? That you have to kind of try to get to that point. So, in a way, life uh, I find life to be grindingly chronological. But there is there is that incredible blistering sense of confusing stuff coming at you, and then confusing responses. Often my responses to people as a person, surprise me or they disappoint me more, more often than I'd like to say. <laughs> um, and one of the great things that I find in writing always is the writing that I love. And, uh, you know, I love Updike, who David and I disagree about a lot. I love uh, uh, Tolstoy and Nabokov and Hemingway and Fitzgerald and Flaubert. Those people, you know, those people make life clearer for me. You know, when you read them, they have extracted the shining thing from inside the slides. They've, they've, they've extracted the shining line of how it feels to, to be with other people, you know, how it feels to what, why one is saying the things one's saying. They found that, and they found a beautiful way to express it. 
inside all the mess of what happens in a day. And so that's the kind of writing, you know, that it doesn't, it doesn't, make, it doesn't make those writers seem smart. It makes those, those writers seem aware and alive. And that's the kind of writing that I've always loved to read. And that's the kind of writing that I've always loved and hoped to do. And again, it's one of the things, you know, there's no one. I mean, it's one of the reasons why all the writers now will say, look, there's not, there's not a good writer you'd find who wouldn't say that the best writer of the last 20, 30 years has been David. And the reason why is that, you know, is that he does that better than anybody. And why the, the cruise ship piece, uh, for listeners who haven't read it yet, is a great place to start is it so extracts from the, the, the glop of the world. And he's so funny about the glop of the world. But it extracts from that glop that shining note, which is me being a person going through the world. I want to make sure I have this absolutely clear then. You had these disagreements with Wallace, but you also hold him as an example of doing the things that he disagreed about the necessity of doing in writing? Yeah, he, um, look, it's, a, it's a disagreement he's having in the, in, in the book. And, you know, the, the, the disagreement that you're talking about in the book is, well, we have first dinner together, and then there's just all the pleasures of being on the road and, and being, being on an airplane on which he's incredibly funny and being in hotels and being in a reading and then being with his dogs and being in his house. Um, he, as a, as a writer, he came to writing, he'd also been a philosophy major. This is something that a lot of people kind of know about him. He, um, he'd been a philosophy major at, at Amherst and a really promising one, so promising that people were saying to him when he decided to go to writing graduate school instead of to philosophizing graduate school, people said, look, you're crazy. Your thesis was so good you could publish it. You could have a career as a philosopher. You know, why are you, um, you know, wh- why, why are you not following this up? And I think that he... I think he took that kind of philosophical rigor to his fiction. And so his first, he said that he thought his first fiction was too cerebral, and he was nervous about entertainment value. And he was nervous about in a culture where entertainment is dragging you away from focusing on what's serious. And, and you mentioned John Franz, I just read his new novel, which is terrific. And that's one of the things that he's talking about. This is a book called Freedom, which is coming out, uh, I think, in early September. One of the things he's talking about is the way the the way American life and I think just Western life in general distracts us from thinking about anything serious and acting on anything serious. I think that in the beginning, David really mistrusted just how entertaining writing could be and how good how entertaining his writing could be. And so I think there's still a little bit of that mistrust. I think that he part of him also wanted to write things that were, you know, harder to read that that were as up to date as as fictional documents as prose documents as good philosophy would have to stand sort of a test as being totally up to date and modern and taking into account all the you know all the philosophizing that had come before it um, so i think that was something that was on his mind even though again he writes prose that is simply more entertaining than anyone else's and i want to get an idea as well of being a writer as as well like like wallace being of his same generation being quite close in age to him and and getting published around the same time as him i mean what does that does that deepen or did did that deepen the sort of conversations you were able to have with him or did did it make it more fraught with issues of oh we're we're in the same uh, quote unquote industry you know we're we're not not competitors but do you know what i mean does that make it more complicated or more interesting well there's two things as um as a writer you think he did it, you know, and that's, that's, there, 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 A, there are drawbacks to that, like, you're trying, as a writer, you're always trying to get that sound, you know, so sort of get that brain voice, and so when David did it, you had to say, okay, he did it, but then B, as a writer, you're like, okay, he's found a way to do it, and he's shown a way to do it, and then C, as a person, as a reader, you think, uh, this is thrilling, there's this person there who's going to be writing great stuff forever, you know, so there's that immense gratitude, and I think B and C tend to outweigh the very selfish initial A. Um, I got a chance to talk to John Franzen about David's work after David died when I was putting together the, the, the piece after David's death. And um, David said a great thing about how I think people who are writers relate to each other's work. I, I asked him if he had shown the corrections. That's the novel of Franzen's that won the National Book Award in 01. Um, and I asked if he had shown it to David, and he said this great thing. He said that David said exactly what you kind of want from a writer who, uh, from a friend who is also uh, a reader and then also a writer. He said, as a writer, you know, I'm envious you bastard you pulled it off, but as a as a friend um, and as a reader, I'm just immensely happy that this book exists. 
and that's kind of how I think uh, any good, honest writer feels about uh, another writer who's done something great. And I want to talk a little bit as well about the the hype that uh, the book received that, that um, of course, Infinite Jest received. And I mean, this is in the same league as the, as the hype a book like The Corrections would have received. Um, he, Wallace, in your book, comes across as being as being not afraid necessarily, but questioning that maybe the hype is is to an extent about itself. What, what do you remember as being the nature of his his concerns there? Uh, he just said that the um, the phenomenon that you that you're here to report on uh, partially consists of you coming here and reporting on me. And so he thought it was feeding on itself. And he said to a lot of the reporters that he would meet on the tour for Infinite Chess, they were smart people, nice people. And they would say, look, it's a really long book, and I haven't gotten through it yet, but, but really, what do you think about the hive? And he, you know, he, it's so funny, he just said that, um, that the, the novel, uh, I think it's funny because there's a thing called Infinite Summer, people make, making a march through Infinite Chess last summer, which took about two months. And what I thought was kind of funny about that was that David said that the, the novel takes two months to read well. I mean, he had no idea people would read it, do a group online read of the book. But that was exactly the time he thought should be allotted to reading it. Um, I think that he said that, that he thought that people might buy the book and they wouldn't read it, and that for him was pretty cold comfort because, of course, you write to be read. And so he thought that people might buy the book for its entertainment value, and then after reading 50 pages, say, ooh, this isn't what I thought it would be at all, which was not, of course, what he wanted for the book. That idea of someone putting it down after 150 pages saying... Yeah, saying, they're making a mistake because the book... There are a lot of books you can say this about, but the book gets better every page. And I wonder if someone says, this isn't what I expected. I mean, surely you've encountered people who have said that. What do you think the people expect if they're not... If not exactly what Infinite Jest provides? So, I mean, do you want to talk about that book specifically? Sure. Yeah, let's let's say, because that's the one, I mean, if someone's going to put down a David Foster Wallace book, let's be honest, they're going to put down that one, if only because of well, its he- I mean, first off, it's heavy. I mean, yes, he, exactly. he made a funny joke. He said that one of his friends getting a copy of the book thrown on his porch, you know, by, you know or the copy of the book thrown by, by, by a postman onto, the, onto his porch said that it sounded like a bomb, a car bomb going off. <laughs> uh, it's heavy. Um, it's very funny because people I've talked to always pick that point about 50 pages through. And I think David, in writing that book, because he said that there were certain things about entertainment that were kind of sinister in that it's a very easy pleasure. And he said that um, he was really trying to avoid things that were as fun as TV. And he said that the, 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 the meta lesson about TV is that you're dumb and that you, uh, and that you want things to be simple and easy and this is all that you're capable of. And that he thought writing, that, that we needed to have writing that reminded us that, that there are parts of us that are a lot more ambitious than that. And there are times also when you just want to pick up an airport book, and where an airport book's incredibly fun. And one of the great things that people who took classes with David at the universe, at, at Illinois State and at Pomona know is that he would assign on his course reading, he would assign, you know, he would assign Tolstoy, and you know, he would also assign uh, Carrie, Stephen King's Carrie, <laughs> or he would assign uh, Thomas Harris' Silence of the Lamps, of which, by the way, Martin Amos is a huge fan too. So he, he knew what was great about stuff that's really fun, and he also knew stuff that was sinister, which, his word, which is that it kind of makes you try less hard. And so what he had wanted to do, particularly in the opening of Infinite Jest, is set up a thing where you're cutting around to a lot of different characters, and it's not clear to the reader. You know, it was, he wanted to give the reader that sense, and it's part of, he said, what the, what the end notes, what the, what the end notes were supposed to be like, too. He wanted to give that reader, the, the reader, the sense of, of how information is coming at you all at once. So uh, Infinite Jest is also a book that is really fun to read the first time through and then incredibly fun to read the second and third and fourth times through because you know how all the characters are going to link up. But in the first 150 pages or so, there are so many different situations and characters that I think it can be a little bit of a difficult thing for a reader. Um, and it's for readers who haven't started the book, if you just get, if you just get through to page 151, I mean, there really isn't a, there, there isn't a, a more fun or complete novel that's come out also in the last 30 years. It's an incredible book, and it's a book that makes you feel just well and also alive. It makes you feel more awake. I mean, there's, um, there's a very famous, we're back to his journalism, there's a very famous piece of journalism he wrote that, that uh, won the National Book Award, uh, the National Magazine Award. In, I think, 2001, it was a piece about John McCain that was in Rolling Stone. And the last line is so great, he says, try to stay awake. 
And Infinite Jest is one of those books where you close it when you close it at whatever section you're in and you just have that great feeling of being more awake. We mentioned the meta lesson of TV being, as he said, you're dumb. The meta lesson of Infinite Jest could, it could be you're smart, but really that wouldn't have been what he wanted. More, more in the sense of you are able to, you're able to be this aware, so you should. Is that more the meta lesson you're getting from Infinite Jest? I mean, he talks about it, he talks about it in the book. He, he, you know, one thing he wanted, he, he, he thought of that book, which is also incredibly funny, as being sad because it's about people not, people needing to commit themselves, having to, um, having to give themselves to something, you know, having to give themselves to pursuit. It's not, in, in this country, he felt you don't just like food, you become a foodie. You don't just like video games, you become a gamer. You don't just like drugs, you become an addict. And in his, you know, in his sense, addiction was a, was a, in the sense he's talking about in the book, addiction is a metaphor for the way we deal with all the kind of things that we love in this country. For better or worse, there's a great thing. I mean, people who like comic books, who really like them, they don't just know comics, they will tell you origin stories and variant origin stories. People who love food will tell you, you know, different, uh, different grinds of coffee bean until you are blue, until they, they're blue in the face. You are, you're kind of, your eyes are kind of half-masking, and your only desire is to get out of the room and find some coffee to wake yourself back up. Um, so what, one of the things that he had wanted Infinite Chess to be about, and what, one of the things that he says Infinite Chess is about, is about that tendency for us as Americans. But one of the things that I just feel that his prose almost uniquely does is just make you smarter as a reader and then just make you smarter as a person. It makes you see both those things that he saw in, in our modern life, as you were saying before, but also just makes you aware of the way you feel. It makes you hear the sound of your own brain voice as you're talking to your friends or your, you know, your husbands or your parents. It, 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 makes, you, uh, it makes you more aware of, of the voice that's talking to you internally, and that is just an amazing and immense gift. What work of Wallace's do you find yourself returning to with the most frequency these days? Well, I keep reading Infinite Jest, particularly, um, you know, the ending's kind of violent. Uh, so uh, for, me, the, for me, the middle section of Infinite Jest, there's great stuff about uh, one of the heroes in the book, uh, Don Gately, living in kind of a, a halfway house for people who are, it's, it's an AA program, but it's for recovering addicts. And that stuff is just incredibly there's a list there of things you learn. And, again, it shows how funny David can be. He said, uh, the, 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 the aside, you know, uh, macho posturing aside, uh, uh, male weeping, you know, can actually feel good, parentheses, <laughs> reportedly. <laughs> so great. Um, he, um, so I find myself reading that all the time. Uh, I, uh, as a professor at NYU, I teach uh, the cruise ship piece as a way to get people to start reading David. Um, I read a story of his called Octet, which is in Brief Interviews with Hideous Men, which I think is a brilliant story. I read Good Old Neon and a story at the end of that book called The Suffering Channel that I think is great. Um, I read his piece about a tennis player named Michael Joyce. I won't give the full title because it's very long. And but it's, it's also the word one. paradigm. But that's, in, uh, that's also in supposedly fun. Um, I read The Depressed Person. Uh, those, are, those are stories of his. There's also, uh, I'm kind of a Borges fan. And so there's a great story in Oblivion called Another Pilgrim, which uh, Another Pioneer, rather, which I think is a great, great story. I read a number of the, the number of interviews themselves are incredibly, incredibly funny. Brief interviews with hideous men is intercut with Q and A's of of men who have some unappealing attitudes about dating and and women and life in general, and I, and some of those are incredibly, incredibly funny. The name of the book, once again, is Although, of course, you end up becoming yourself. A road trip with David Foster Wallace. David Lipsky, thanks so much for taking the time to come on the program today. Oh, Colin, it was great. It's great. It's great talking about David. Uh, thanks for having me on. This has been the Marketplace of Ideas. I've been Colin Marshall. And you can find our complete interview archive on our website, colinmarshallradio.com. You can also find the website of Ben Althaus, the man who produces our theme music, at benalthaus.com. If you have any questions or comments or feedback of any kind, any response whatsoever, send that along to Colin at ColinMarshallRadio.com. That is Colin at ColinMarshallRadio.com. C-O-L-I-N is the spelling on that. Thank you for tuning in, and we will catch you next time. 